begin. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm glad to see you here today. Uh, we have a wonderful guest, and we're talking about an incredibly important subject. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. We've been talking about information as long as we've been doing the Future Trends Forum. We've covered it from a wide range of angles. We've talked about information technologies. We've talked about information policies. We've also talked throughout about the different ways that different academics engage with information. But this week, we have something unusual, taking a different tack on this. Our guest here led the development of a manifesto about the information environment inhabited by young people. And obviously, this matters to the extent that colleges and universities educate young people and will educate more coming up. This is a fantastic document. It is beautifully designed, incredibly thoughtful. You could teach a seminar off of it. And in fact, if you haven't seen it, look at the bottom left of the screen. Uh, there's a little button there. It says Young People and Information. You press that uh, and it will pop right up. And in fact, if that's not enough, uh, we uh, the author, uh, Alex Grek, has also produced a concept map uh, which breaks down all the different ideas that structure the manifesto, which is pretty amazing. Um, now, all this is showing you stuff. What I'd like to do it actually is to bring the editor and designer up on stage. Um, this is one again, one of our Maltese friends. So let me bring him up right now. Hello, Alex. Hey, Brian. Good to see you. It's good to see you. Well, what time is it there? Um, it's just gone seven minutes past eight in the evening. So it's uh, past my dinner time. Yeah. Well, well, good evening. We'll try and keep you from falling asleep. <laughs> you won't. Alex, we, you know, we have, a, we have our tradition on the forum of asking people to introduce themselves, not by talking about what they've just done, but what they're going to be doing for the next year. And I, I'm curious, what are the projects and also the ideas that are top of mind for you? Uh, it's a long one. I mean, I, I, I wear two hats. So I'm, I'm still teaching at the University of Malta, where I, I teach new media in the Faculty of Media and Knowledge Sciences. So I'm just finishing a study in it now uh, with people aged from 20 to 26. Um, I'm then heading off to Split in June, where I'm giving a keynote on oh. society. Uh, if you know more, I mean, you know, I have a love of music. So in August, I'll be at Way Out West in Gothenburg. And then probably nice. in uh, October, I may be anchoring an OSCE conference on misinformation and disinformation in Vienna. And then it, it kind of rolls wow. on. Fantastic. Fantastic. So you're going to continue that work on in information. Yeah. And uh, have you, remind me, have you been to Split before? I haven't actually. So that's one of the main reasons why I really want to go. Besides, um, I've, I've just lost, lodged a chapter on, uh, or a book which may be published by Routledge, I think, on small states and media ecosystems. Oh, uh, good. Good, good, good. Well, it's uh, uh, the uh, the Roman castle that dominates the city is is pretty astonishing. And it's, it's, it's worth time to wander in. And uh, of course, the, the the food is is quite delightful. Um, but I'm I'm so glad to hear that you're going to continue all this work. In fact, here let me just change the screen up so that uh, um, we're we're in a more conversational visual here. Um, well, I, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. And and friends, the the way this usually works, if you're new to the forum, is that I ask our guests a couple of introductory questions so they can cut loose on their work. Uh, but then it's over to you. So as Alex responds to, to my interrogations, uh, think about what you'd like to put to him, what questions you'd like to ask, or what uh, ideas you'd like him to respond to. And again, uh, please feel free to use the chat box to share your thoughts, and uh, also to uh, either click the Q&A box to put up um, a question, or click the raised hands if you'd like to uh, be on stage with us. And I think it's pretty obvious from looking at Alex that you do not need to have a beard to be on stage. I just want to clock that rumor right now. Um, I, I should address you quite formally, uh, for, at least for once, uh, Professor Grek. The, um, there are so many rumors, so many cliches about the information environment that our students inhabit. Uh, by students, I'm thinking traditional age, teenagers, people in the early 20s. When you completed this project, uh, what were some of the uh, myths that you were able to bust? What were some of the kind of counterintuitive or surprising findings? Yeah, um, I'm not sure about busting myths. I think th this is a kind of process where the more you dig in, the more questions you end up with. So even if you look at that mind map, you know, once you've gone down the rabbit hole, you, you mm -hmm. need, to, uh, need to find a way of occasionally extracting yourself. Um, I think in terms of my point of departure, and it's something that 
you and I have talked about in the past. Um, and, and this is how I, I guess, got into this whole post-truth society thing. Uh, and then started really thinking about information is that, I, I guess it wasn't so much as a eureka moment, as much as that I was somebody who had come to academia late in my life. Hmm. Um, so I started teaching, you know, I got a PhD in 2012, 2013. I just happened to be the first guy with a PhD in my country with anything to do with internet and internet communication. So I was just invited to come in and do something. And then I created a whole bunch of stuff. Didn't even realize I ended up with a tenure job like about five years later. But I think I, I started to gravitate towards the idea that media, whatever that may be, you know, mm -hmm. Um, technology, whatever it is and will be, and education are are contributing uh, in, a, in in some way or in a significant way or significant way to bad information or good information. And when you start to dig into information, you then quickly start thinking about misinformation and disinformation and malinformation and, and various hybrids in between. Um, so I think in terms of the, the I, I've always been of the the mindset that if you want to learn something, get a whole bunch of different people from very different disciplines, hopefully in the same room. So this whole process really started in, I guess, in 2019, pre-COVID. And then I had organized a, a big conference in, in my tiny island. Again, the good thing about living on an island of the Med is very easy to get famous people to come over because they like the sun and the rest of it. So I had anything from philosophers, technologists to uh, educators to activists to you know people who thought we were all wasting our time get a whole you know get 300 people in the same room and see what happens and film it and this is also also the approach i've taken with my side gig which is running the tree sale foundation called mm. what if connected learning so we filmed all of that stuff and that's when we started thinking we've got something here i mean this is like a long intro brian but i guess it, it helps dovetail into where this myth busting is and then just as we were, you know, what shall we do? Shall we set up an international network? Shall we move this roadshow somewhere else? We're going to go to the Netherlands at the time. COVID hit us. So then what I had to do is repivot everything into a book. Then, you know, we all know what happened or didn't happen in terms of education institutions with COVID. Fast track to 2022. And I kept on thinking of Dana Boyd's It's Complicated, which was, mm -hmm. you know, you remember that all of us oldies are all internet hippies. Um, it was certainly complicated in 2014, and I, I, I thought let's let's get people here again. And again, we got people from anything from bureaucrats, policymakers, but I wanted the focus to be on young people to come in and tell us what they thought was going on on the basis that we'd had Trump and post Trump. And we all knew that our information was being gained, and did we all care about all this stuff? And, and again, we ended up with a second wave of material. And so then what we did, and the manifesto was in the back of my mind, I got a bunch of young people who were working around us. And I, I got them, as opposed to me, the oldie, to go in and listen to what they were hearing. And they came up with notes. And we, we didn't even want to publish this at the beginning. I just thought we just put up everything online. But then I kind of started to go back to old school, Brian, and like the idea that you can open up something and, you know, just find a graphic or something and just say, you know, does this mean something to you or not? You know, it's, it's, that's how this whole thing started anyway. Did we bust any myths? We're in a complicated time, I think, right now. And I think it's going to get more complicated. And if you get to our age, like you and I are, we're almost contemporaries. I'm older than you. And running out of time, I'm increasingly focused on what can we do in the short term to get people's attention as to... Mm whether it's policymakers or technologists or educators to get something done out of what I still believe is a, is a crisis. So if we, if, so thank you for that background. Thank you for, for giving us that. And I, I'll definitely uh, second the convening power, both of, of the wonderful country of Malta, but also of yourself, because you do a fantastic job of, of organizing and getting people together to think together. I mean, it, one of the things that, that we hear about a great deal is that uh, a lot of young people now are in a post-literate state of mind, that they are uh, reading less and less, they're experiencing more in terms of visuals, uh, and that uh, they're, uh, in, in many ways, that has altered their approach to higher education, among other things. Did you find out, did you find any, any trace of that kind of uh, post-textual experience? Yes. 
I think that's one for sure, because I mean, what what I've also been doing is I've been using the manifesto almost like a, a project with my students. So I typically would teach a cohort of 60, 70 students. Um, and I remember the first time I ran this was with people who are doing digital arts degrees. These are creative types who suddenly actually were looking at Gen AI like coming towards them like, a, mm -hmm. you know, wh where's my life going to go? And, mm -hmm. and and then they, we, we, we kind of hit them with 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 this and and I got people to come up with podcasts as to what did they think about the manifesto. And there were certain things mm -hmm. which started to come to light from, well, first of all, post texts and texts. I mean, manifestos may mean something to people our, our age. I realized that they don't mean much to people who are younger unless they came from a certain type of background. So, of course, the philosophy mm -hmm. guys would get it. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that from the design, the aesthetic point of view, I got a lot of people say, Oh man, this is so boring. It must have been designed by an old guy, isn't it? It's very male. I mean, I even had people going through it and say, yeah, somebody counted, I think, the number of references there were, and they said you didn't have enough women in it. And so I think what, what I got back from the design people was it's got too many words. Um, you need to speak to us in our language. Our language is increasingly visual. Um, to which I replied, so what do you want, uh, emojis? And then I pointed them to a certain couple of pages when I said, do you realize that the manifesto is not really aimed at you, but it's aimed at people who actually need this kind of language to get something done in terms of policymakers, regulators, people in power and education. And then we started having different types of conversations. So that's almost like the first iteration of what the manifesto was all about, because I my intention was that people could just grab it and do what they want with it. Do they want to have an exhibition or a poster campaign with some of these slogans and whatever works, man? I, I think that's what I had at the, at the back of my mind. But I think the second thing is, and I think we've got to be very careful about this, is the so-called generation disconnects. Okay, mm -hmm. we all know about, you know, the old Pransky things of digital natives and digital migrants and all of this other kind of stuff going on. And... But you and I are parents of people who are Gen Zs, and mm -hmm. my son keeps on reminding me, don't put everybody in the same basket. And just because people don't react quickly or don't seem to relate to these kind of issues, it doesn't mean that they are not, not thinking about it. But there is a feeling of helplessness, which I, I, I'm coming mm -hmm. across even with my students. In other words, when you start talking about you know, surveillance capitalism and social media addiction and the attention mm -hmm. economy, Mm -hmm. I'm increasingly getting this kind of thing. It's just move on. And then occasionally when you start digging into it, you say, what is it? And then you, you're told, oh, we're not the issue. We get this. We know we're in an unholy bargain with Silicon Valley and all of these other social media platforms we've been trusting. We know they're stealing our data. It's, it's what it is, right? The problem is not me. There's, a, there's an issue with the 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds trying to get onto TikTok or faking their identities. And it's those guys you, should, mm. you guys should be worried about. Hmm. So this this thing is forking in a in an interesting new direction now. Hmm. Huh. So beyond Generation Z to right. whatever com whatever comes next. Yeah. Oh. Well, that sense yeah. of resignation is fascinating um, because you know we, we we see people moving into ever smaller uh, social domains. So instead of using Facebook, they'll use uh, a right. Discord group um, or they'll uh, you know, inhabit a lecture. Yeah. 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 Well, TikTok as long as as long as it's available. As long as it's available to you guys, yeah. And but increasingly, I mean, I remember, you know, I, I was kind of fascinated by this idea of Gen Z entering the labor market, and then getting disenchanted with being in the labor market, and then, mm -hmm. and I, I think this was quite publicized. Now, people are Gen Z about to get fired or be, you know, or want to leave, and using TikTok live as they're waiting to get fired. Yeah. And I'm yeah. putting it up as part of this. And, and that then takes you into this whole, I, I guess, the world that people are, are, are used to, I guess, and that people like you and I had to migrate into to try and understand what's going on. This was perfectly natural to people that you, they feel that there's some sense of injustice happening, that they would put it back with the media that they have. Um, and that's, I think it's another interesting fork because the questions I kept on asking is, let alone, you know, the young people relate to manifestos. Is, is a manifesto a relevant term for young people in 2024 who want to change something if they want to change something? 
I started looking at this kind of, you know, passive aggressive kind of activism, which is which is happening. And then occasionally things erupt again, like they're erupting now on campuses because of girls and because of lock-ins and things like that. And again, people will use the media that they have to try and, I guess, resist whoever is the oppressed. And um, so I, I think we're in this kind of interesting time, isn't it, in terms of this generational divides. There's a, there's a book by Gene Twank. I, I never know how to pronounce mm -hmm. it. Four generations, and I, I think it's a it's a it's 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 a report. I think I think that's been twenty years of research. And when when you read it in Europe, like I do, there's parts of it which are very much made in the U.S. So maybe this is what's happening in the U.S. and maybe this is not what's happening in Europe. Specifically in terms of things like regulation. I mean, you know yeah. that the EU is trying now having recognized or blaming Silicon Valley for the kind of mess we're, we're kind of in because of the data. We're now trying to move very quickly into AI regulation. Um, but, you know, blame it on the boomers is still very much there. Um, and then let alone all the, all the other issues, which again, information. And again, I think going back to the whole concept of information, we all know that things changed dramatically because of COVID of people having been locked in that's in a way you know social media and and anything else online was everybody's saving grace maybe kept us sane or maybe drove us insane so again the other things i'm finding as an educator is is students being very open about mental health issues mm. and some of them would blame the media that they're using some of them openly claim that they're addicted to it and some of them don't know what to do so that's why I said in terms of busting myths, I think we're still at a stage right now where I'm trying to find some funds to have some research in terms of generation disconnects and I think information and disinformation, which is a bit more context specific. Till now it's very much rooted in the US, I think. Well, it's really important to get out of the US bubble for that. Uh, I mean, so when we're talking about TikTok, for example, we look at India, which already shut it down, which is pretty interesting to think about. Um, I'm just curious. Do, do you do you have a sense from uh, uh, from your research that uh, beyond uh, young folks blaming uh, their information environment for causing mental health problems, uh, to what extent do they see uh, solutions or uh, or help in their information environment? Yeah. Um... I'm not sure they're coming up with solutions. I think they're aware that there's a problem. So let's start from that. And and I I go back to the tripartite. I mean, we all know that life is not in black and white, right? So if we blame media, whatever the media is now, okay, and technology, whatever it is, and education, I think they are trying to associate solutions coming from still those three pillars, the hegemony of those three pillars, whatever they might be. Um, my my stall and um, one of the things they are suggesting definitely and i'm seeing this definitely in, in nordic models is mm -hmm. they, they see a greater need for media and information literacies early on in life so when i'm Ooh. working with my colleagues in sweden say mm -hmm. you know if you're age five you're immediately being told that if you're using one of these things not necessarily that what is on the screen is truthful that you have to you know kind of think about what there is over there at a very young age I think the second thing that I'm finding is that they're saying older people like us are expecting people to come into higher education with some degree of critical thinking. Mm. And their view is, where the hell do you read this? Where do you, where, where do you learn this? Especially in, in kind of the, the kind of education systems, the one size fits all education systems, which are predominant in old Europe, for instance. There's a bit more flexibility as you go up north. Your way, there's much more flexibility. So one of the things they're saying is, can you, can you find a way of getting some of this stuff and do two things? One, write it in a less academic language context, even if you want it to resonate with us, or else we'll do something else with it. And, and in a way, there's been an interesting development. I started speaking to the education people here, the compulsory education people, and, and there is there's a chance of a side project where we will try and repurpose some of these things so it can become part of the curriculum somewhere. Mm. But I'm always very wary of compulsory education for a number mm. of different reasons. Compulsory education is necessarily political in this part of the world. So just 
I'm going to turn this over to to the audience because their questions are building up like a storm cloud already. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, why don't we just uh, what why don't we uh, run from here? You know, since we're doing a video conversation, and why don't we just you know set up a whole series of uh, short videos about uh, information literacy aimed at people who are 15? I think it would be a brilliant idea, and I think people from different contexts. I mean that that would really be a brilliant idea because again. I guess, uh, Brian, this US versus the rest of the world thing, and you know because you travel widely, you've been here a couple of times, okay? It's, you really feel it. I'm also getting bored with this whole thing of blame everything on Silicon Valley. We, we know that there's no such thing as a free lunch. We, are, we have all known, and I think that's my frustration. We've known for, what, 15 years what the model is. You know, mm -hmm. we, don't, we, don't, we don't have to watch the movies or get shocked by anything which appears and under the guise of investigative journalism. We know what's been going on. The, the thing is, what can we all do about it, whether we're wearing an educator hat on, an activist hat on, or, or somebody working for a nonprofit? I don't know. So again, I don't know what the backgrounds of people gathered here. Oh. Well, if, if you want to say a bit about your background in the chat, please feel free to. Uh, just offhand, I can say we've got quite a varied number of people um, uh, a wide range of ages, also some uh, librarians, some technologists, some uh, some faculty, um, and a, a couple of I think publishers and a, and a few more folks. Um, well, I'm I'm glad we have that kernel of an idea. Um, so hopefully uh, um, someone can run with this, and of course I'd be happy to to help out. But but we have we have questions, and I, I want to get out of the way and let people share that. Uh, we have one from uh, our good friend in the Houston, Texas area, Tom Hames. Uh, and asks this from a kind of institutional side. Uh, do we provide our students with adequate tools to manage today's information spaces? How should higher education adapt to the realities of the modern information ecosystems? Uh, as usual, a big, deep question from Tom. It, it is a big, deep question. I'm, and I'm, I, I can only share my personal experience, OK? Um, and I'm very frustrated about this. Because again, we've all tried flipped classroom techniques. We, you know, I mean, so typically, you know, we'll use our VLE and, and try and get people to read stuff beforehand. I go back to the DNA of the education system in a particular country. In my country, if it's not examined, if it's not marked, then mm -hmm. it may not necessarily be valuable. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's and I'll, I'll just flip you another ridiculous situation, okay? And, Again, somebody from the University of Malta is probably listening to this. That's fine with me. Okay, uh, because I teach cohorts that are also involved, not just from my faculty, but say from the Faculty of Arts. The Faculty of Arts decided that even if I'm teaching or my colleagues are teaching using projects, they still wanted us to set an exam question and for them to be examined yeah. that way. So they're still locked in the in the kind of fact regurgitation thing. I mean. So who do I blame? Do I blame the university? Do I blame the faculty? Do I blame the education system? Do I blame the fact that countries like Malta, probably like India, are absolutely obsessed with, you know, PISA and, and all of these kind of stats? Um, so in terms of what works, I'm always telling people that if you want to get into co-learning, you can learn as much via a YouTube clip as you may via reading a decent book. Getting people to read is increasingly difficult. I'm finding that. I'm also finding that people are relating more to podcasts than mm. they did. And I think that's one of the pleasant surprises, which I found as an educator. That maybe because people are multitasking, or maybe they're going jogging and they're learning, listening to some of this stuff. So, Tom, I don't know if that answers your question. As I said, I, I don't have specific answers. Maybe I have more questions the deeper we're getting. But I really like the idea that if we could find a couple of pilot projects, because that's what I've always found whenever we did something which changed stuff. I'll give you an example, okay? I, I did quite a lot of work, for example, related to verifiable credentials on the basis of self-sovereignty mm -hmm. and self-sovereign identity of students, okay? And I've always found if you want to get something done, it's kind of cushion it as a project, as a, as a pilot project, get some people from different countries, film it, make some noise about it, and at some stage, somebody, whether it's a publisher, or a policymaker, or a permanent secretary in a ministry somewhere, or a school, or, or a university rector somewhere, and that's the way we've been kind of working with some of these other 
EdTech project. Somebody sees something, if it works in Malta, it must work in the Bahamas. And that's sometimes what's happened with small states. Or sometimes a small city might say, oh, I've seen what you guys are doing. Let me try and do this in Amsterdam. I think we're still at that stage. It's messy. So I think even though I've, I've again, I've had colleagues who years ago were talking about, you know, getting students to actually run the classes themselves, prepare the classes, getting assistance to help them teach. Sometimes I worry that COVID taught us nothing. Okay. Mm, That's, too. you know, you know, we, we had this, you know, and all of us know, all of us. I mean, I, I remember when, when the whole crisis happened, there were faculty colleagues who were worried about using Zoom because they never used it or worse. The worst one I ever heard was, oh, I don't want to be on a screen because students will laugh at me. Mm -hmm. Which the mm -hmm. obvious question was, they're already laughing at you. Or else <laughs> the other side was, you know, let's let's everybody, if I'm doing an online thing, I want everybody to have the camera on. And I was one of the people who said, you can't do that with people who are in their bedroom or don't want to show you what their social environment is about. That opened up a whole new can of worms and I thought we we're going to get something done. As soon as COVID kind of started, you know, it, that's why I relate the example of the exams. Let's go back to exams. Let's go back to whiteboards. And I'm not saying there's, you know, I still love teaching in, in real time, but it's so difficult to get anybody's attention when you've got the shields of computers or mobiles in front of them. And I still haven't had the kind of guts to tell people switch them off. Let's try and have a real conversation. It's very yeah. difficult to have that real conversation in the class. I think the problem that you're describing is one met by quite a few uh, faculty as well as quite a few students. Um, Tom, thank you for elevating the conversation with, uh, with a really powerful question. Uh, and Alex, thank you for wrestling with it. Uh, I think the two of you have, a, have quite a lot in common. Uh, we have a, a, a lot of questions coming through the chat. Um, people are, are pointing in all kinds of different directions. Um, the uh, And I, I just want to pull a couple of these out. Uh, actually, one, if I can kind of channel one of our, our good friends uh, closer to your time zone, uh, Alex, um, we have a, a wonderful colleague at the American University of Armenia, uh, Brent Anders, who does a lot of work in AI literacy. And I... This, this is always the problem. You publish a good book, uh, everyone's excited about it. And the first thing they ask is, well, I have this other thing I want you to talk about. Um, and, and so I, I'm, I'm curious, what, what role do you envision for generative AI um, in terms of the information uh, environment that young people inhabit? Are, are you going to, do you expect to see most of them uh, shifting to using tools like uh, ChatGPT, Claude, or Perplexity to make stuff? Uh, or do you think they're just going to be inhabiting this as the as AI gradually reshapes their information environment? Um, how many hours do we all have here? Because we're all grappling with this, okay? We, and, we are, and, and we have been on the forum. And we have yeah, a bunch of sessions. Yeah, on and I've seen some of those conversations. I mean, I, I think it's it's always the polarized views, right? And I mean, I've just watched, I should share this with you, Brian, later, okay? I was asked to, to review this film called The End of Humanity, which is, again, is a, is a bunch of academics in Switzerland and Germany have come up with this, hmm. with this film. And it's all, all related to AI information day, which I think is going to be in July. And I've actually said this as a project for my students, that watch this film. And this film is basically saying the future can be what? Either the transhuman way, okay? We're all going to become cyborgs, almost, okay? Totally dependent on machines. And then there were the philosophers kicking against it. Okay, so we, we've got this big crisis, and I think most of these facts, myths. I mean, I've got a colleague called Noah John Syracuse. I don't know if he's here. Okay, he's a maths professor. Noah, somebody I've learned a lot from. Okay, and, and Noah will tell you he 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 he, he see, still sees the AI thing as you know. Remember what happened the last time the calculator showed up, mm -hmm. and, and the kind of crisis related to it. The, the education system was first relate, you know reacted in that way you know you can't you shan't you can't use these tools you're gonna cheat and the rest of it i know that my students and i've just said them an essay to do look at the film think about this here's potential futures what do you think is going to happen of course they're going to use chat gpts and clothes and whatever it is to come up with it and i think my job is to get them to use those tools mindfully to ask mm. the machines mm. a better question mm. now are we already going into AGI and the transhuman stuff? Is that what the future holds? I really don't know. And nobody well, knows. We, we, we can get down that road, but I was specifically asking about generative AI as we're seeing it emerge now. 
yeah, oh. I, 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 so I think, I, I think people are using it. I'm not discouraging people not to use it. It would be silly of me. I think we've tried, you know, like, like some examples of, you know, like garbage in, garbage out. This is what happened. I think the machines will get better. I think there's also some other, again, copyright issues, which I think are going to need to get resolved. I still think we're going to end up with some sort of Spotify moment in terms of what happened with records. And there will be some sort of agreement because clearly the machines are stealing stuff, of copyrighted material. Um, but I, 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 I don't think we have any choice. It's, we, it's already too late. Let me put it this way. It's already too late. So in the same way that I think some people are saying, look what a mess we had with social media platforms. We all got so excited about the read write web and we ended up with the mess. In my part of the world, people are kind of scrambling, trying to regulate. You know, you yeah. can't, you shan't. But I've also seen examples, again, in the education sector, okay, where there are people trying to throw AI to kind of um, curb the worst potential excesses of generative AI, but we don't know what it's going to be. So we're, we're, we're at this moment. But I'm telling my students to use it, of course, of course. Well, thank you for letting me ask you a gigantic lumbering question and, and from uh, bringing that from somebody else. Um, the, uh, I appreciate your, your humility, um, but also your, you know, the powerful thought you have behind that engagement. And I just want to make sure everyone hears the part about Alex saying his mission is helping students use these tools thoughtfully. Um, and I think a lot of people in the, in here will be of the same mind. Um, we had a, a, a related question. If I can bring in another technology, this is from, uh, let me pull this up. Uh, this is from uh, Melanie, excuse me, Kay Hampshire. Uh, and she was wondering, uh, you've written many publications on blockchain. What happens when blockchain and AI converge? Good question. Um, let me start with blockchain first, okay? Because my interest in blockchain is specific. I'm interested in blockchain education and verifiable credentials. That's quite narrow. Mm. Okay. I'm interested in decentralized technology as a means of empowering the end user. Again, I don't want to bore you with the whole issue about who owns the credential. You'll be amazed that most people in institutions, registrars, think that the credential is owned by the university. Mm -hmm. Actually, I have to think that it's owned by the recipient who has slaved away through his her day you know, five years and it belongs to them. And that's the project right. that we actually ran with in Malta. So in Malta, again, 15 year olds who, you know, at 16, you can leave school. Every single person who, who ends up with a school leaving certificate, it goes from paper to PDF to notarized on the blockchain using Bitcoin standard on block certs in a mm. kind of permission, permission blockchain. So we mm. kind of used to that and kids don't realize that the blockchain is being used because it's just another system, but it's a kind of cool thing. It's an app. Now, what's going to happen with AI is, is a good question. Again, are we going to use decentralized technologies to kind of curb, you know, the, uh, the gold rush at the moment? People are talking about that. Again, in my part of the world, you, ha you have to now look at blockchain um, and identity. In Europe, there's this, there's this project which is going to be the EU Digital Identity Wallet. Mm -hmm. and the discussion now is can you use the digital identity wallet and use blockchain technologies okay, to enable you to then use this wallet to collect stuff about you that belong to you. So your health records could be one of them. And that will be very important. Now, we're still talking about what kind of technologies are going to be used because I repeat, even if we ideologically like the idea of decentralized technologies, and by the way, I don't own Bitcoin or anything like that. I just like the idea of Technology doesn't necessarily belong to the usual gang, hmm. but belongs to a whole bunch of other people. If, if the EU digital identity wallet does use technology and the EU has already invested millions building blockchain technology as a public good that people can lock into and use for and repurpose, it's almost like a system integration thing. That's going to be a big game changer. I always believe that when technology goes quiet, silent, people hmm. don't talk about it. It's mm -hmm. when it's likely to be most useful. And I think, mm -hmm. again, old people like us know what happened when the internet, you know, gold rush crashed, you know, at the end of the last century. Okay. And that's when the whole social media stuff started to happen. Okay. And I think that's what's happening with blockchain. With AI, I think what concerns me at the moment is, is the hype cycle. 
I still don't know whether the, the whole issue is, you know, all of these kind of doomsayers from Musk to anything and all this whole thing about AGI is just another marketing ploy until people catch up. Or, or, or what's going to happen around the corner. I still think that the only thing we can do, I think us as educators, go back and look at better technologies. But we need to repurpose our education systems. I repeat, our education systems are, are still grasping with the idea of exams, cheating. You shouldn't, you can't, and it's, it's way too late. Let alone then the whole storification, which is the domain of media as we used to know it. And as we may know it, so I'm I am really worried, Brian, that you know optimists like you and I and Howard used to be, and how Rangel used to be in the old days, you know, that we kind of pivot into kind of the other side now. You know, it's up to us to try and do something while we still can. I'm trying to do that, and I'm glad your cat, my cat, is, is that Hunter. I think yeah, um, yes. yeah. Um, what can we do? I think is what we should be asking now. What can we do about it? And my job at the moment, what I still can do it, is I'm trying to annoy policymakers, annoy educators, publish some stuff, and get maybe a bunch of young people around me and get them to use their own language to, to kind of you know, understand some of this stuff if it's important to them. Because I'm still being told that for people, entering the workplace is important and they're kind of disappointed. Mental health issues, are important, and I'm not an expert on that. Gender issues are important, and I'm not an expert on that. And they can, again, all of that is appropriated to the online world, the information that they're getting on the online world. Um, I think we, we just need to be careful. I'm not, I haven't given up hope that young people don't care about activism. I think they do, but I think they're gonna do it their own way. I think they're gonna do it with the tools that, that they have. Then again, you guys might get Trump, so. Again, yeah, we did it once. You'd think we'd learn. Um, well, uh, first of all, thank you for the for Kay for the for the really good question, uh, bringing together two gigantic ideas. And Alex, thank you for so elegantly uh, dancing with both of them. Uh, I, I, we, and, and friends, if if you haven't had a chance yet, um, please feel free to uh, either click the raised hand button if you want to join us on stage. I, I can't promise if one of my cats will join us again. He just had a good time climbing on me um but uh but we'll we'll welcome you uh or if you want to hit the q a box you know again that's a question mark button uh or if you want to say something in the chat uh one thing that has come to the chat a, a few different people have mentioned this and i, I want to bring back this idea and th this is this is not a new idea this has come up more for since the 1990s uh mindy cullen uh actually mentions this she says uh, get the 15 year olds to make the videos about media literacy um and i'm curious about uh about the university life uh to what extent can we uh shift to having students making more and more information within the context of our academic structures that is to you know make more videos for class to make more podcasts for research uh, to really become that kind of uh, uh information maker that uh creates the world they inhabit again brian it depends on the context okay I, the only way I'm managing to do it is by telling people it's a marked project. So again, even with a cohort of students I'm currently teaching, the, the first bit was gather in a group, which is always very uncomfortable for people because group hmm. dynamics kick into it, hmm. um, and do a podcast about A and B and C. I don't care about it. Can I just go around do it? Here's a bunch of links. Uh, it's messy. Learn, okay? But it has to be marked. In in my part of the world. If it's not marked, I repeat, it's not deemed to, deemed to be useful, which for me is incredibly disappointing. Now, if you look at higher education, I think we also have to stop the myth, though, of trying to sell young people the dream that just because you go to university and graduate and get a funny hat, you're, you're set up for life. And the one way I've used this, even when working with bureaucrats in the European Commission, is to stop talking about education and start talking about lifelong learning. It breaks down a whole bunch of silos even within different dgs in europe for instance okay so i'm sorry I mean, uh, dg in europe the, the director generates in europe for example you'd have dg education and culture and the dg employment and dg it and dg connect and dg labor and guess what they don't necessarily talk to each other like bureaucrats don't a b again i need to be 
careful because I'm, I'm still remembering the blockchain um, question. Just because there are people like us who believe in the power of one and power goes to the student, power goes to the learner, it doesn't mean that there are people in education systems or policymakers who believe in that. Okay, for most people, if it's feather, you know, it's federated, it's better. Okay, governance still means centralized governance. IT system still means I can trust, say, the usual gang, you know, gang, Microsoft's, IBM's, rather than the, okay. trust something decentralized. It's even got funnier because in my case, because I, I was kind of an architect for a very anarchic system that we set up in most 2017. Now I've gone back and started asking questions about that was just meant to be a big pilot guys what's happening now oh we're using it yeah mm. and when i said well we could potentially change change some things i was told leave it alone because it works <laughs> so that's the way that's the way the policy guys tend to tend to think that's the way the education sector tends to think it might even be the way the registrar in an, in an organization all of this stuff implies change and change implies either crazy people or I think people who want to work as organic intellectuals within the organization, I don't see any other way around it. Well, th thank you. Uh, you. You just you just took us through a whole series of, of, of ways that this idea of students as information maker play out. Um, everything from uh, federated architectures uh, to uh, to questions of the heavy hand of, of uh, assessment. Um, I, I want to make sure that people get a chance to uh, ask more of their questions. And, and here's one that came in from the University of North Carol Colorado from Annie Epperson, our friend uh, and librarian. And let me just flash this one on the screen for us. Uh, given the demand that AI has on the electric grid supply, how do we offset the carbon cost? As we become more dependent on tech that uses electricity, we step further from meeting a uh, climate change temp target. Annie, I, I want to follow that up with a question of my own. Uh, but please, Alex, take take a back at that first. I, I, Annie, I'm really have zero almost expertise on this, but we face the same situation when we were doing stuff with the blockchain in terms of electricity consumption and stuff like that. The promise always was it's better to do something which which has problems, but it's trying to change something rather than do nothing at all. Um, I didn't mention the whole climate change thing in terms of young people's awareness or not awareness of this and again i'm educated by my son you know i don't know what i know i don't know what world i'm gonna leave my son i know i live in a place where it's already very hot and sometimes it's very cold i don't even have spring here anymore we go from winter into whatever it is now mm. in terms of the technologies what they're using i i really don't know it's not my area of expertise and i wish that people could contribute to these kind of meaningful conversations before Policymakers make the wrong kind of decisions. I will repeat, many a time, these big decisions get taken by people for the wrong reasons in the same way that you can have happy accidents. Hmm. I managed to be in a position for a period of time to drive some significant change in my tiny country, despite having no power at all. But I kind of had an open line with the Minister for Education who kept on asking me two things, you know, and he couldn't say, I don't care about the technology. I care about education because he was a teacher. So he said, all these new things you want to do, are they good for students? Yes or no? And in terms of blockchain, we had said, but it consumes whatever it is. He said, well, let's try it out and then let's look at it again. But if it's something that can help students, it's better. In terms of the climate change consumption stuff, I'm not the right guy to come back to. But I think you know more about it than I do, Brian, seeing what you're writing. Well, uh, that that is something I've been I've been working on a great deal, and um, but I I, I want to make sure first of all that uh, that I thank Annie for the for the very good question, and Alex, I appreciate wrestling with it because wrestling with this hyper object is uh, is is a monster, um, and uh, I'm I mean one thing we know from all the polls uh, around the world is is that the uh, younger people are much more interested in climate than than their seniors, so it may be that uh, climate becomes an issue that matters for them for AI. Um, but I, I, I want to make sure that we have that we have time for a, a, a couple of uh, more questions uh, before we run completely out of time. And this is one from uh, Ben at Skidmore College. Uh, he uh, works in the uh, uh, learning experience design and digital scholarship group there. Uh, and he asks another typical, very good question. I'll put this up here. Uh, assuming young people are moved by the manifesto and changes that are needed, what recourse do they have to initiate action? 
and, and keep in mind, Skidmore College uh, educates uh, traditional age undergraduates. So this is a very momentous question for Ben. I, I think what we're trying to do, and this is where I'm putting on my 3CL hat on, okay? Mm -hmm. um, we, try, we try to get young people in front of an audience of policymakers. So I'll give you an example, okay? I mentioned the OSCE, which for reasons, you know, which are quite obvious, especially once the Ukraine war started, started becoming very interested in mis and disinformation. So we're, we're sending one of our young guys, Alex, another Alex, who's going to go there. And again, he was one of the guys who actually helped scrape the manifesto and get these guys in front of the guys with suits and start talking about some of these issues. Okay, and maybe in more in Alex's language, if I haven't translated or interpreted it enough, okay, remember that the manifesto was ultimately reviewed by a whole bunch of PhDs and whoever turned up at the conference and other people. I think it's our job to help young people find a voice. But again, I'm very cautious about this whole thing about bundling all of Gen Z in, in one basket. I'm also very cautious about you know, this whole generation disconnects thing. Okay, did anybody ever get on with their parents when they were, you know, 19, 20 or whatever it is? No. However, the corollary is this, and I'll play you a ridiculous example. I'm, so, I'm sorry for my brother. My brother is the editor of the Times of Malta here. Okay, last week, he went off to the Ukraine and did, did this 17 hour journey and was hoping to interview Zelensky with Europe Day and went off there with mm. the. Okay, risked his life, went there as soon as they got their air raid, whatever it is, and let's get disappeared and whatever. He came back and wrote something. Okay. Option two. One of my students, and he's a really sweet guy. Okay. When I was asking people, what are you doing? He said, I'm doing a lot of social media. They eventually came up to me and he said, I'm, I was on Love Island. And he's actually making a living as a young influencer. Hmm. Okay. On the basis of using the media probably better than I can. I'm sure you can use, you know, put up reels much quicker than I can. Um, and that's not so, it's a word that I'm, I've been trying to understand. And I, you know, we all, all know the academic background behind it and all the, the, all the red flags, but for him, it's, it's quite natural that he's seeing this as a, as a, as a career pathway. And he's my student, he's a communication student, and he's there to learn more about how to use the tools for him to become entrepreneurial. He told me I've managed to buy, you know, get a, make enough money in the first year to, to put a deposit in my own apartment. Now, who's right and who's wrong? So me telling him, you be careful or else your 15 minutes, Andy Warhol, 15 minutes of fame might not last that long. Or, or just be careful, you, you know, you leave footprints or you're not always gonna look beautiful, you know, and, and the rest of it. So we're in this kind of, so sometimes I really feel the generation divide and sometimes I really want to get better at listening, and especially mm. when it's the climate change issue, or really what do young people think works? I'm, I'm a bit bored about the digital natives versus digital migrants thing, because one of the first things I do with my students is, why is a 62-year-old man teaching you anything? You guys know it all. As soon as you opened your eyes, somebody took a picture of you. No, that didn't happen with me. Okay, so... Prensky's thing about, you know, I think I think maybe we have the benefit of remembering a life pre-internet and post-internet. I'm sure you've discussed this before. They only know what's, what they know. And I think I am obliged to keep on harping about information and media literacies. Because I know it's too late. By the time they meet me, at least in my country, it's too late. The rot has, mm. it has, has set in. Mm. And... And I'm just hoping that I can get them addicted to this drug called learning, that when they leave university, they keep on finding their own pathways and shake whatever trees they need to shake. I think that's what we're obliged to do as, yeah. as educators. I sometimes think of it uh, instead as a psychoanalytic model, that they, they, they come to us having uh, all this experience, but it's largely uh, unreflective or uh, subconscious. And uh, our job is to uh, make it conscious. And, and to uh, you know to make the, and by applying all the armature of of, uh, of university thought, uh, everything from you know computer science to media studies, sociology, economics, and and to do that. Uh, Brian, what I'm worried about is more fun than what I'm worried about though is that at the regulation table at the moment, hmm. I'm only seeing lawyers and computer yeah. scientists. 
I'm not yeah. seeing the guys from humanities at all. So our lot are not there. Okay. Oh, quite true. That worries me because again, we all know what happened with the whole social media and the Zuckerberg thing. Okay. It was all meant to be wonderful. And then the engineers, you know, came up with engineering solutions for essentially one business model called advertising. And that's why we're in the mess we're in the right, you know, so part of my job and people like me in this part of the world, and I guess you, you guys is, is to keep on banging the drum that we, we already I repeat, we've known we're heading towards a car crash with social media platforms for years, and in, in we went. And whether then the metaverse was presented to us as the new big thing, and now the AI is going to be about the new big thing. I think we are obliged, I think, to keep on doing our educators' job and trying to get people to think sideways. I think that's what we have to do. Think sideways. Oh, that's that's very, very good. In, in the chat, a uh, librarian, the librarian from uh, the... Uh, 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 a wonderful uh, rocket organization. Uh, Carolyn Howard says, we need ethicists and historians at the table on the regular. And, uh, um, but George Station, uh, also from California, points out all the AI ethicists are outside critiquing and looking in. Uh, Correct. But, but the, this information environment is all about swapping the inside and outside. Um, and, and so uh, hopefully this is something that, uh, uh, that we have the power to do. Um, Friends, we're, we're at the last couple of minutes, and and I just want to ask uh, Alex one last big question. Uh, and if you want to, uh, if you want to chime in, please, you know, hit the hit the chat. Um, the Tom Hames adds, "There is no inside or outside anymore. It's all blended. Yeah, we're we're in a kind of uh, continuous Klein bottle." Um, I, I'm I'm curious, looking ahead a bit, um, how do you think the uh, this younger generation, with their information environment, the 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 group of them that becomes faculty that becomes university staff how do you think their practice is going to change do you think they're, they're going to get retro and do a kind of historical reenactment and and learn how to write books or do you think they're going to uh, try to get the academy to respond to their information habits i think i'm going to riff off what tom said on the hybridity even even here okay because we're still at the moment where the academy is still resistant to change and will keep on clinging to its victorian model of assessment mm. teaching and whatever not all of that is bad by the way because frankly you know I'm, I'm worried about people not being able to write properly and relying i mean i i get emails like you guys do or even whatever with emojis on them and i can't even see what they are whether i'm copying cowboy or something like that i think that's that's one of the issues that i can see I think younger faculty, at, at least I'm seeing that in my university. But again, it, it, they're coming in with the idea of movies and making movies and stuff like that. My concern, however, remains is, is different. In the same way that I supported my son when he wanted to, be, to go and read history. And I thought that was one of the most valuable things that he could have done, because unless you understand the lessons of the past, you can't project into the future in the same way that you were into literature like I was and many of us are. We desperately need to cling onto that, onto, onto that narrative. At the same time, there is still some very powerful stuff even happening on TikTok because in the attention economy, and I know we're all down to our 10 seconds of attention. It's very difficult even here just to hear, an old, you know, a guy from Malta riff of something. So whatever works, man, that's what I think it's going to be, whatever works. Okay. Well, that's a great answer. And uh, what works is what this has been about. I, Alex, putting your brain in, in communion with the future transform is, is just a wonderful experience. Um, I'm really grateful that you found time at this, this late night in the middle of the Mediterranean to, to speak with us. What, how, I mean, given, given all of your work and information, what are the best ways to keep up with you these days? Uh, is it Twitter slash X or uh, uh, LinkedIn? It, it, I'm on LinkedIn. I think you search for Alex Grape on LinkedIn. If you look at 3CL.org, that's the organization I, I lead. There's a strategic plan there, which basically I wrote with a couple of colleagues over Christmas. And that pretty much tells you what kind of projects we're into. So there's one about young people and information. If you want to join us and do some work together, the door is open. There's one about generation divides. There's one related to people entering the workspace, okay, and getting either disappointed or wanting to do other things. But we're interested in connected learning. And it goes back to the old stuff that you and I used to do with when, when Howard was still doing his stuff. I still yeah. believe all of that. 
all, all, all of that stuff. But it's putting it into practice with whatever time that we have. But yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you'll find me on, on, online. Um, but LinkedIn is normally a good place to do, or alex.grek at 3cl.org or at university, you'll, you'll find me. Well, that's a great answer. And this has been a series of great answers. Thank you so much. This work you've done is so important. And I'm really glad to help spread the word a bit and to do so in conversation with so many people. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Brian. Lovely to see Be you. Be safe, my friend. Take care. And er everybody else, um, please, thank you for all the thoughtful questions. Uh, I think we just had a really, really good conversation looking at these issues at both really high level and also probing deeply and seriously what they mean for education. If you want to keep talking about these, uh, please hit up these socials, including LinkedIn, of course, as well as Twitter, Mastodon, Threads, and Blue Sky. Just uh, hit the use the hashtag #HFTTE. Uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions covering these topics, uh, starting perhaps with information literacy, you can go to our archive at tinyurl.com/ftfarchive. Uh, if you want to look ahead to our upcoming sessions, which touch on, among other things, AI and education, as well as how to reform grading and higher education as a whole, just look at our upcoming sessions at forum.futureducation.us. Uh, thank you again uh, for talking with us on such incredibly important topics. It's always a pleasure. I hope all of you stay safe and well, and we'll talk to you next time online. Take care. Bye-bye.